To understand hypersonic flight, we need to consider bow shocks, shock layer radiation, viscous interaction, shear layers, the chemistry of the flow field, boundary layer transitions, flow separation, recompression, and a lot of other stuff. So make yourself comfortable, because this time we have a lot to call up. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Our thermodynamics is a hybrid branch where aerodynamics intersects thermodynamics. It is a complex field which is studied at university level and in real life it requires a lot of complex computer modeling to obtain a useful result. So I'm going to present an overview of the problems that happen at the hypersonic speed and make the flight so challenging and the weapons so hard to design. There is no real discontinuity in what happens if we increase the speed of flight from low subsonic to hypersonic. Mass and energy conservation still apply. Fundamental equations governing fluid motion and heat exchange are still the same. What changes is the relative importance of the effects at different speed. At low subsonic speed, the air behaves as if it was incompressible, like a liquid, and viscosity is of little importance. As we increase the speed, compressible effects start to appear, till when, around Mach 1, which is the speed of sound, shocks start to form in front of all the surfaces exposed to the free flow. While they seem very cool, shocks are only an obvious consequence of the fact that any disturbance in a fluid can't move at a speed faster than the speed of sound, which actually is a disturbance in itself. So, the flow upstream can't be influenced till the object is materially there, and there must be an abrupt transition when the object arrives. If we accelerate at high supersonic speed, the aerodynamic heating becomes an important factor. Fighters of the 60s and the 70s were mostly capable of reaching Mach 2 and beyond, but when they flew at that speed for more than a few minutes, the heating was enough to strip the paint and damage the rivets of the leading edges. To make the SR-71 cruise at Mach 3, all sorts of measures had to be taken, like using titanium, planning the thermal expansion of the metal panels, or actively cooling some surfaces, or running the fuel lines just behind them. The Soviets solved the problem by building the MiG-25 with steel, less prone than aluminum, to lose strength with the temperature. This is a school of thought that has some modern American supporters too. The problems are less important for air-to-air -air or surface-to-air missiles. They do fly up to Mach 4 and beyond, but they fly at that speed for a very short time, a matter of 20-30 seconds at most, while the whole flight may last a minute or so, so their materials do not need to resist for a very long time to high temperatures. If we accelerate even more, we enter the hypersonic domain, where heating becomes more and more important and a whole lot of interesting things start to happen. In front of an object flying at the high speed, there is always a shock wave. That is a surface where the temperature, pressure, density, and speed change abruptly. In this process, a lump of air that crosses the shock is low down, potentially to a very, very slow speed. In fact, at the tip of every object, there is a very small region where the flow is basically stationary, which is called the stagnation point. In principle, it is where the temperature is the highest because the flow, slowing down, converts its kinetic energy into heat. The variation of temperature in Kelvin is proportional to the square of the Mach number and it can easily reach the thousands. For example, again, the SR-71, while cruising around Mach 3, reached external temperatures around 600 Kelvin. At the speed between Mach 8 and 10, which is the design speed of the hypersonic cruise missiles, 
currently being in development may easily exceed 2000 Kelvin and particularly low altitudes where higher density is still high. It is easy to understand that this is a big engineering problem. Luckily, there is something that we can do about it. As we have seen, the flow slows down through the shock. At the nose, there is a region of subsonic flow and since the air is moving slowly, it is the region where the temperature rises the most. The flow then speeds up again and becomes supersonic again while moving toward the back of the vehicle. The outbound flow takes away the overheated air, so minimizing the size of the low speed region becomes a design goal. To do so, the most important parameter is the shock standoff distance. Intuitively, the more space you have between the shock and the body, the more room is available for the outbound flow. The shock standoff depends from the radius of the leading edge. The larger the radius, the larger the standoff. This is the reason why space vehicles enter the atmosphere presenting a flat surface to the flow. The shock is at maximum distance and the outflow of heat is at maximum too. Actually, the maximum flow of heat between the air and the vehicle is inversely proportional to the square root of the radius. So the larger the radius, the smaller the heat flow. Obviously, there are no free lunches because a flat body has also a lot of drag. A spacecraft entering the atmosphere has the objective of slowing down and landing safely, so a lot of drag is beneficial. An ICBM warhead has the objective, well, it actually has a very unlucky place as its objective, and it wants to get there as fast as possible. This is the reason why there are conical and quite pointy ICBM re-entry vehicles. And hypersonic cruise missiles needs to fly and maneuver at hypersonic speed, so a blunt nose is quite a severe performance penalty and it's not a viable solution. We will cover these aspects in detail in a future video. Blunt or pointy, you always want your body to be completely enveloped by the bow shock, whatever the shape and size of the shock may be. In the thin shock layer, there is an abrupt change of conditions and a lot of the fluid slowdown happens exactly there. So a lot of the heat is generated right inside the layer. The heating is at hypersonic level already and the shock layer literally radiates heat into the flow. If part of the vehicle, like an aerodynamic surface, is out of the bow shock, it means that the shock itself is impinging on it. And the shock is actually touching the part roughly in the same position during the flight. Considering the temperatures involved, it is like having a blowtorch at work on the structure of the hypersonic vehicle, literally cutting through the metal. Secondary shocks originating inside the main shock where the fluid has accelerated and is going hypersonic again can do considerable damage too. It is famous the case of the last flight of the X-15 when some test equipment positioned near the tail of the plane generated secondary shocks uh, that cut into the structure and almost caused the loss of the plane. This is the reason why, because space vehicles enter the atmosphere with their large surface head-on, while hypersonic cruise missiles are thin and slender. Another element that makes an already complex field even more complicated is that at temperatures around 2000 Kelvin, oxygen starts dissociating. The O2 molecule is broken down into highly reactive and corrosive oxygen atoms. The good news is that part of the heat is used to break down the chemical bonds, reducing the temperature overall. The bad news is that the gas constants used to make the thermodynamic calculations start varying, making everything even more complex. Around this speed, also plasma start forming, a small concentration, but enough 
to have effects on the functioning of the apparatuses that emit or receive electromagnetic waves. These issues are not negligible for hypersonic cruise missiles, but hypersonic glider vehicles or space vehicles enter the atmosphere at speed two or three times faster, while they are even more severely affected. All these harsh thermal effects are challenging. The vehicle requires special materials and active cooling systems to survive. In the case of space vehicles, ablation material that sublimates away is extracting heat from the hottest regions is in use, uh, particularly for manned spacecraft. Space planes usually have some sort of ceramic protection capable of withstanding the high temperatures. ICBM warheads use dense and heavy material as a heat shield. For example, depleted uranium is used to build the external cone even because, well, it improves the warhead yield. We know little about the hypersonic cruise missiles, but it can reasonably be assumed that they use ceramic in combination with some form of active cooling. Probably fuel is rooted in the areas that are exposed to the highest temperature, uh, obviously before burning it into the engine. Obviously, the introduction of all this energy in the aerodynamic field has consequences also for the way the air moves around the vehicle. Lift generation, stability, control at hypersonic speed have their peculiarities that make the design of hypersonic planes and weapons immediately recognizable. But this will be the subject of another video. If you like this video, you can watch those beside me to learn more about the hypersonic weapons if you are interested. Then please like, dislike, subscribe or support on Patreon. In the meanwhile, thank you very very much for watching and goodbye.